All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Tyler Magyar. We're at Way Down Wines in Portland. It's uh, February 3rd, 2020. Tyler, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, start with the most important question of all. Why wine? Why wine? Um, <laughs> in a less sexy way, but, but more honest, blockbuster video. Um, there were like two video shops in my town and two record stores and the idea when I was a kid, long before I could consume alcohol or was, knew anything about food, um, the notion of walking into a place where someone who's now about my age or, or even younger who seemed you know, old at the time, you could walk in and they were a specialist and they could guide your experience. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a video shop um, from high school or, you know, and, and younger uh, and spent two or three hours looking for a movie to watch. Um, and the same goes with music. I think a lot of what my interest in, in wine could easily be transplanted into another. It's almost a coincidence. Um, but somewhat sarcastically, blockbuster video because the idea of specialty and knowing so much about something and share, wanting to authentically share that, um, it was really easy to kind of fall in love in that sense. Um, but my dad's a chocolate maker. So I guess the real answer in a sense is that. Um, he, it was his only job basically. He started on the boardwalk in Seaside Park, New Jersey when he was like 14 years old, just needed a job uh, and worked on the boardwalk just like, you know, chasing girls and making taffy and making, you know, was he probably $2 an hour. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up in that shop. So the connection to blockbuster or music stores or retail or anything like that is really just the fact that like I had no choice. I was forced into this. We, I grew up in a little like small kind of well-to-do beach town and um, my dad was one of the only people who didn't get on the train every day to go to New York to sell bonds. He was a brown collar worker because he had chocolate stains. And um, you know, I would, do, I would do homework underneath the little chocolate melter and I would sit in the front window. So very early on the idea again, whether it's movies or music or chocolate or anything like that, A, the idea that every time someone comes in my door, they're excited to come here. I mean, like, no, no offense to tax, you know, people who do taxes or something like that, but no one walks into H&R Block excited. Um, but people walk in my dad's store excited because he had a passion and he had a story and he had something he wanted to tell and do. Um, <clears throat> and that just, that really resonated with me. So growing up, I always thought I was going to be a, well, for a while, I probably thought I would end up a chocolate maker, but I knew my dad and I get along very well, but we don't work together well at all. So I was like, something's gonna have to happen for me to really do this as a job. Um, but really, I think it was the influence of like working around, I'm trying to not say the word artisan, so, you know, line. <laughs> um, working on people who, who work with their hands and their work tells a story. Um, and then being able to work with the end product directly. Because whether it's a customer who just wants a, a horror movie they haven't seen before, or someone who just got into punk rock and wants something that's louder, or someone who you know hates Sauvignon Blanc but wants to learn more about an area of the world because they're going there. Um, it's all retail. It's all just just personal connections, I guess. That that got me here, really. Tell me about wine specifically. Was there a was there a moment when wine became something you were interested in? I remember my first taste of wine was like a boxed Merlot in my grandma's backyard. Um, I feel like a clam bake off, so not a good pairing. <laughs> and I, I, I hated the smell. Like I still remember sometimes when I taste wines I don't like or that have been open for a long time. It like, I kind of like going back to that feeling because you can easily, in, with nostalgia, you can easily recreate a moment by playing a song. But like flavor and, and taste, um, it takes a while to kind of get there. So. Um, you know, before like dinner parties or we're going somewhere, my mom would stop at the store and I'm going to just like hammer down retail with this um, self-servingly. Um, it was leaving the chocolate store, going to college in New York um, and uh, kind of seeing how people treated this thing. I was interested in travel. I started to travel at that point. Um, I got more interested in food and I wish I could really dig why I looked for my first job in a wine store, underage, you know, pulling boxes in, in a basement. But it was kind of like, I'll probably get hired here because I can just tell my dad's story and he'll be like, sure. You know, like, <laughs> I, I probably gave him a very romantic idea and he was like, can you lift 30 to 35 pounds? <laughs> but it was a little shop in the Lower East Side. And um, I just got more and more interested. He I shouldn't incriminate him, but you know, he would tell me to send the recycling, you know, take it out at the end of the night, but it was a bunch of quarter full bottles because he knew that I, after a certain amount of time, I was interested and wanted to explore more. 
Um, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but the, the very idea of wine being so transformative and precious. Um, I don't like it as a class or status symbol and just, you know, filing a bunch of things in my basement away, but the notion of a special, um, a special moment or a, or a point in time that you save a wine and open it up and share it is, is so universal and, and, and timeless, really. Um, so it was a really strong, easy marriage from, from chocolate and from wandering around, you know, the punk and ska sections of record stores. It's just something a little bit more adult that in my uh, late teens and early 20s I could pursue. Um, so I bounced around New York working in shops and lifting 30 to 35 pound boxes of wine. <laughs> of wine. And that's, you know, at the same time, I was really interested in magazines. This is like, um, I went to kind of an arty school in New York. <laughs> and uh, um, <clears throat> I was really interested in magazines because I think I was like the smartest dumb person of all my friends or maybe the dumbest smart person. I edited the school paper in high school and, and was interested in, in that world, but I wasn't bookish enough. I wasn't in honors classes. So like real literature, it was like magazine people are going to hate me for saying that, but like, <laughs> you know, magazines are sexy books. And I got really into that at the same time. So through college, I started interning. Um, I got a job at, uh, at GQ because I helped a woman take her, uh, pick up an air conditioner at Home Depot. And I was just like, <laughs> are you hiring? Are you hiring? No, no, no. Yes. You know, and just from there. I think having a name on the resume it was like the most inconsequential job I've ever had. But people go, oh, you know. And I've, heard, kind I've of, heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, was, I mean, it was in the fashion department. I was just like moving, you know, Javier Bardem's sweaters from room A to room B to, to get photographed. It was not, not fun and, and unpaid. But um, I made my way to food and wine. And um, I knew that was kind of where I wanted to be. Um, I, they had had like a bunch of NYU, I think like math majors intern in the wine department before. It wasn't a formal position. And Megan Craigbaum, who, who hired me, who's a wonderful wine writer now for Punch Magazine and, and among others, really like democratic, good writer, good boss. She, there's a lot of different points and that's the ambition, I guess, of this, but I'm, I'm now like locating these little points that it could have gone wrong and sent me elsewhere to make a better living and, and be less happy than I am now. And, and it's her fault, maybe, my, maybe a dad's fault first, and then Steve at Some Never Wines and now Megan. Um, it, she just shared my love for wine and, and approach and even at a, a, a somewhat corporate magazine, and I don't say that necessarily in a bad way, but they couldn't, in a, in a structure like that, they couldn't talk about the wines that I then sold at September. You know, it was, just, it was different, and I totally understand that. Um, but I loved it there, and it's uh, finally, I, maybe not finally, because I'm in college, but in college when you're just kind of, it's a, it's a pep rally to become that person you really want to be. Um, I was like, holy God, it's junior year, I'm, I'm, I have that thing, I'll just work here forever. You know, they'll give me $500 more a year until I die, and it'll be fine. Uh, let me remind you that this is the magazine, the publishing industry in the late aughts. Um, you, so, you timed it well. <laughs> it's perfect. It's <laughs> stuck the landing. Um, like hiring freezes and the financial crisis and whatnot. And um, <clears throat> throughout that time, I, I think I worked at three or four different wine stores. Just I worked at an Italian wine shop literally because I knew nothing about Italian wine. And in my interview, I said, I want to learn, but I don't know. And he's like, can you lift 30 to 35 pound boxes of wine? <laughs> sure. Um, I was lying. I still can't. No. Um, but you know the hiring freeze. I just I kind of had my dream job in the form of a of a, a little paid internship, um, the first paid internship I will know. I will I thank them for that. Um, uh, yeah, and and from that point I kind of like I was in I'm from New Jersey and I'm going to say that in this interview as many times as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. um, a lot of friends went home after college because they were like I don't know what to do. Some of them snuck into cool jobs. Some of them there was just kind of this divide maybe thirty thirty thirty. And um, I just started putting resumes out in random spots, but mostly abroad, just wondering where I can go. And um, <clears throat> there was like a coffee company in, in Budapest that you know didn't pay anything, but they were like, we'll help you find an apartment. And there was like, um, I don't know, like an English teacher in, in the Netherlands, and I love the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And, and I just kept on thinking France. I had, we had an exchange student briefly when I was younger. Um, which was really great. My dad, you know, as much as he can be bullheaded and kind of of his own mind, he was really open-minded and like made sure that I traveled a lot as a kid and took me around. And then, you know, when we had this exchange student, it wasn't like a fancy rich person thing. You know, it was just like, yeah, we have an extra bedroom. You can come here and, you know. So a kid from Paris came and stayed with us when I was younger. 
jumping timelines pretty bad here. It's perfect. But uh, I, I, I had an old girlfriend in college who studied abroad, and I always like resented in myself that I had a lot of hustle in college, in a sense, because I mean, I had fun, I did cool things, I, I, but I just was like, I had a part-time job, and an internship, and school, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I got good grades, except every every year I'd get like a D in some class because I took on too much. <laughs> Graduated fine, you know, all of that, but. With all this kind of career woe and, and where am I going at some point, I went with friends to Canada to like help them photograph a friend's wedding. And like maybe a couple weeks after graduation, I had like, you know, 30 or 40 applications out different places and a family in France answered um, to be an au pair. And I was like, Eat, like I'm cutting the line to get a, a decent visa. I get money, I get to live there, I love kids. And she's like, we have, you know, someone who like cooks and, you know, really down to earth family, of, obviously of means, but. Um, really lovely family with two twin boys and I went and like was just their buddy and I drove them to practice and you know I was supposed to stay nine months and I ended up staying three years <laughs> I mean, when you get that good visa you don't let that, that's gold like people marry for that and so I hung around for a while with them and that was a really great experience to kind of reset because I think the buildup of college was so like you have to do this and build and everything has to amount to something else um, but so begins this kind of like branching out other period that I maybe, I really was on for about 10 years, and maybe, I don't want to say I'm departing from, because I'll always have that spirit, but um, it ver I very much credit it with leading me to exactly here in a lot of ways, um, because I got to explore food and wine in a very different, not better fully way, but, you know, European model that, like, when your dad makes chocolate by hands every day, like, that's pretty Frenchy, Belgian, German, you know, that's not like, it's not really the America that we live in anymore, unfortunately. So to just like drink cheap bottles of Muscadet by the, you know, people are gonna hate me listening to this. <laughs> the education was really hard. No, but to just escape myself and, and the, like the college ambition and go somewhere different and travel and taste food and wine with, pe with different kinds of people. Like that was, <clears throat> that was a, a huge education in a lot of ways, you know, like, and it was, it, it, I just stayed there long enough to the point that I was like, I'll just be here forever teaching English. So I should probably go do something else. And, and New York was calling, and I think the creeping back of, you know, kind of college ambitious linear Tyler was kind of creeping forward. And I kind of thought, just like college, I'll go back, and people love the story, and I'll just, you know, and I struggled again. <laughs> and it was it was tough. Um, but I started up in a in a wine shop called Thirst that I had applied to in college, and they gave me like a two or three page questionnaire. And I failed miserably the first time. And I just, I, I, I think I forgot it was the same store until I was working there for a couple months. Um, and there were a lot of really great people who I now know who are in all over kind of the states making and selling and doing things with wine and food. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit of a, um, I don't know, a launch pad. Um, but it was a tiny husband wife store that sold pretty much just natural wine. Um, but they're in Fort Greene in a little cute neighborhood. But, um, a lot of people who lived nearby just thought it was a, a neighborhood shop. They didn't know that it was artisan or, or, lo, or, or you know, this kind of wine from these sort of places. They just wanted a $12 whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that, I loved natural wine and come in, had come into it in Paris in a way that, but they didn't call it natural or even organic. It was just the wine that that Cavis liked. Um, so I came into it with a really, in a non-rebellious, um, kind of honest and just sort of like sincere way. Um, and that's a, that taught me a lot. And unfortunately, I mean, like in New York, I probably hop jobs and shops every year and a half or so. <laughs> Just a bunch of, you know, like a, a clash of different outlooks and just to, to do different things and work in different places. Um, and it was really fun. I loved being in a, in a like a real corner shop because it felt like my dad's story. It felt like I was st standing between my mom and dad because, you know, my bosses there fought as much as my mom and dad did when, you know, in their shop. But they left really strong impact. Um, and I went to another store in the financial district called Passanel and Son, um, which was just like, re they had a 64 Fiat parked in the middle of the shop, you know, and, and Marco, the owner, is a designer, and, and, and his wife was a designer, and they had, they had their hands all over arts and whatnot. Um, and it was just like everything about the corner store, albeit, you know, a, a downtown New York clientele, which like, I really didn't relate to in certain ways, and just because when when someone's bonus is your is your salary at some point, you just you illustrate this divide. And great food and wine is there to, to locate it, but I you know every time I worked in a store, and I've maybe now worked in ten or eleven, you kind of make these adjustments as to how it will be the store that you'll eventually own. I probably still do this, wanting to like go to some little town and open up a tiny shop that has twenty bottles of wine, you know, because there's no retirement here. 
But, um, you know, I had just little adjustments. And Portland had always kind of been whispering. I remember at Food and Wine, I was working on a, I was assigned Portland for a little wine article. And um, Megan had just said, call up these places that I have on the list and then find whoever else you want. Ask them for a PDF of their wine list. Like literally that's it, nothing emotional, just ask them for that. And I was like, fine. So I got on the phone with like Naomi at Beast and um, this must be 06. So I was, I, Le Pigeon was opening around then, maybe had been open. And a bunch of really interesting places that w restaurant concepts that were very novel for New York or for America in general. Again, preaching the choir of like the uniqueness of our, our scene here, not only in Portland, but Pacific Northwest. Um, it just always, it kind of had nagged. Um, of course, affordability was an issue in New York, and that was a false promise here, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like the first time, you know, I, I eventually, Portland kind of popped up, and I, I was with an old partner who also wanted to come here, and she, she had come in February and was raving about it. And if you love Portland that much in February, you, you know, there's something about it. And so she would rave, and I'm, it was like an ex-boyfriend. And I'm like, w what's up with this guy? <laughs> we'll go to Portland. <laughs> that summer we went, and August is very easy to fall in love with a place like this. Um, a good friend from Thirst, one of the shops I was working in, had w made wine before, and, and he's just like, you're gonna go make wine out there. And I was like, no, no way. I'm, you know, I, I had even more imposter syndrome than I have now. And I, you know, it was probably just like, I'm gonna work in shops for a little bit and then just jump back into, you know, work a boring job in an architecture firm or something kind of nerdy that paid better or something. But, um, you know, saw, saw Portland in, in August of 15 or 14. I just fell in love, and, and I think I, I was getting really, I don't want to be mean. I was just like fed up with New York. It's really easy to be young and, and have no money there and a student because there's a wealth of things available to you. And it's obviously very easy to be, to be old and wealthy there. But if you're in the middle, the instant you're not falling, you're not in love. And I think I could, the same could probably go for retail and just jobs in general. If no matter what you're paid or what it happens, if you love what you're doing, you can, you can live forever. And I, I grew up in a household where my dad was his own boss, for better or for worse. <laughs> My sister's helping out now a little bit, which is good. Um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of kind of misleading ideas to do what you love because mm -hmm. not everyone can afford that. Not everyone lives in an environment where you can even find that thing. But. My, my addendum would maybe be do what you love within reason, you know, and, but pay your bills and things like that. So I came out here just kind of like to restart, um, just like France. And I think I was a little bit more refined, but a little bit more messy at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and started working on some like fancy stores in a sense, like fancier than New York in a way, just, you know, Vinopolis and, and Liner Nelson, where they really hammered down like we tasted so, so much wine and sold to a very well-heeled clientele. And, and it was great in a lot of ways because I, it was a new test of that knowledge, of that kind of like local shop knowledge. Um, but that same kind of thing that would go, come and, and go every three or four years of like, I'm never going to work up and do anything else in this. I'm never going to make more money. Um, I wish I like remembered the feeling in a sense of like that brought me to production. I mean, I remember the events in a lot of ways. Part of it was... We're in wine country here, you know, 20, 20 minutes down the road, up to, you know, 20, 30 miles down the road, you're standing on soil. And in New York, you're talking about soils to people who really don't just want a Sancerre that tastes good or a Burgundy that makes them look good um, to someone else. And it's so estranged from that process. Mm -hmm. And w walking through every cave, and, you know, if you, and a winery here, a cave, they're all pretty, you have to like wine to, to be entertained by it. But all the same, um, I felt pretty estranged from it in New York, but I just loved the stores and my client deal, so it was fine, in a sense. But I did feel that, and I, I wanted to challenge it at some point. I'd been in stores long enough that I had to do something new, and same with Portland, especially in stores where I'm just shipping well-priced wine across the country. Um, so there are a number of people that I would just like help bottling. Um, a friend, Sterling, from uh, his, his label's called Holden, um, really knowledgeable person, like scrappy in so many ways, just he pulls things together with amazing and interesting wines. And like Jim Fisher from Fossil and Fawn, other people has like a real wine background, educationally speaking, um, and is c still pursuing that now. So biology and then all like the, you know, and then same as I kind of did, just like helping with the bottling here, helping clean this and that. So I had just, I just got curious and he and um, another guy, Michael Garofolo, uh, Portland Psalm, who now makes his own wine um, called Cutter. They were working together and they just kind of invited me inward smartly because I was like, I'll do whatever you want for free. Um, but it also takes, you know, it's, it's not just something for you. You have to enjoy who you're working with. Not that I worked with them, you know, 
I wasn't hired by them or anything. I would just show up whenever I could. Um, I should say, just um, uh, we'll amend the record, I guess. I moved here really um, thinking I was going to go into wholesaling before I got into retail. Um, Scott Frank, who makes the, the Bone Arrow wines, of course. I love his interview with, that you did with him. And I, I talked to him about it, you know, and, and, and it resonates so well. Like, I, he was a real kindred soul. And back in New York, the only Oregon wines um, that I saw were either very corporate, kind of indistinguishable wines, or very expensive, kind of. And there's nothing wrong with either. Like, I, I think the, 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 the taxonomy of it needs all of that. But I didn't see that middle thing of stuff that I drink. And we sold, a, like, we sold rhinestones, his Pinot Gamay blend. And like, that's in my Hall of Fame forever because it was democratic and it was interesting and it had a pretty label and people liked it and it upended expectations of wine should be. And you know, that was maybe wine number four in a list of a hundred of just like things that changed me or, or you know, my, my little stack of empties. I just tell the story and talk a lot less. Um, and he was opening up a distribution wing here and he wanted someone outside of Portland. Um, and someone from Chamber Street, great store in New York, mm -hmm. recommended me to him. I flew out and uh, like, did an interview with him with his daughter climbing all over him in a, in a restaurant, you know? And he's just, it, it was so good because he interviews the way that I'll, I'll hope to one day interview. And he talks about wines the way I love talking about wines. Um, and we just talked about like punk rock and music and, and work ethic and ideas. And so I'm a terrible salesperson and I did awful at that job. <laughs> Um, that's no surprise to anyone who I've sold wine to or to Scott. Um, but it exposed me to like to the market here properly. Everyone who sold wine in Portland, um, some of the producers just incidentally. Um, so again, like reconciling that, realizing, oh God, I'm not going to have a career in this. I can't do it. Tiring of retail to some degree. It just was this perfect storm of basically really moving into to production was like, this is my my last little test to see if I, if I fit here. Mm -hmm. And not because I, I didn't feel that I felt discluded, but because I thought I'd done what I needed to. And I'll retire to Astoria or, well, that'll be too expensive by the time. But you know, I'll go, I'll go to Idaho and have a little wine shop when I'm whatever age, when I retire at 94. <laughs> but um, I just thought this is the last piece of the puzzle. And I thought of my friend Tim, um, who runs an, an import company here now, or in, in the States at least, who told me you're going to do production and I didn't like it, but you're going to love it. And I, and, you know, his voice resonates. So it's like, look at us. Um, but from helping Sterling and other people just do bottling or just wandering around their urban wineries or elsewhere, I had an electric car at the time, so I could only go so far and it, it made it to Medici and back where he was making wine. And that's it. <clears throat> well, at Medici, I met a guy named Andy Young, um, who makes wines called the Marigny and, uh, St. Reginald Parish. And he just like, he's like a, you know, a, a gentle giant, like, of, uh, you know, you'd think he's all bullish, but he's the sweetest, you know, softest guy um, who walks over with a sparkling base. And he's like, I've been working on this. It's not going to be ready for three or four years. What do you think? And I was like, whoa. And it was just a little point of contact. Nice down-to-earth guy who liked the same wines as me. Um, I'd started growing more weary, warrior weary. Line. <laughs> bored of retail. I was bored of retail. And so... Um, I guess 2017, yeah. Um, I saw Andy at a tasting, or Sterling's birthday party, and then at a tasting, and he kind of mentioned, oh, I might be making wine in the city now, moving out of, out of the valley. And I said, great, because I have a, an electric car that can't go very far. <laughs> I mean, just like, I'll, I'll visit you sometime, you know, and I biked down, and it was here, where it was moving. Um, the Springwater Corridor is just here, connects us to Portland, it's like eight miles to downtown. Um, and I just showed up one day, kind of intrigued, and I, Ask him some questions, and he said, like, "Hey, can you grab do that over there?" I said, "Sure," and just really like naturally, I was like, "Can I come back tomorrow?" I've not, I just had a breakup, you know, the amicable, decent, you know, not heartbreaking, but still difficult in some ways breakup, and was kind of taking off another layer of skin to kind of get at who I, who I am and what I want to do. Um, so I showed up every day for a good long while. It's like the we always will quote high fidelity record stores like I hired these guys three days a week that was six years ago they just kept coming back and that way he really needed me and not to be self-important but he definitely needed me that year in scaling and in being in a different space and I really needed him because I was just I had time and and passion and I had tasted a lot of wines mm -hmm. so we just we mellowed each other out or just kind of completed one another in a certain way um and that harvest you know I didn't have a car anymore I just had a, a bike so I would leave Leonard Nelson at like six or so, bike down here, 
um, help him out. We'd start at seven or eight or so and work until three or four in the morning and I'd bike back home and sleep a touch, go to Leonard Nelson. I'd sleep under the desk in the back of the shop. You know, we got our lunch breaks, which was nice. So I set an alarm, I would like wolf down lunch. And, and I think that was a real turning point because when you do something that sucks and you love it, you have to listen to that. Um, it's up to you the triangulation of surviving off of that and, and finding something feasible, but like, it sucked. And I loved every second of it. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm young and new in this. I'm on my third vintage you know, in 2020. And there's so many things that suck. And I love it and I'm coming back. And, and it's just like that kept, it kept sucking. And I kept thinking it was awesome. So I, I just followed that voice in a sense. So we finished the vintage together. Um, and he kind of worked some things out to where he could hire me full time for the next harvest. So I gave my notice at Liner um, that summer, I guess, and started with him down in Methvin, shared, you know, proper winery with their own wines and then um, four or five different tenants. And, um, you know, I had a little beat up pickup truck at that point, but we were just doing so much work. I lived on a tent, like on the vineyard in a tent, basically, <laughs> through all of harvest. Um, you know, they have like a fancy, they, it's, not, it's not a helicopter pad, it's like a area of grass <laughs> that like helicopter tours would sometimes come in and I would get a text and be like helicopters coming so I'd like wake up after finishing work at three in the morning and the helicopters coming at whatever I move my tent over to the side and you know every day I would like put on my boots with the tooth you know my toothbrush in my pocket and just march up like I live there you know and <clears throat> I think they know that <laughs> Alan was okay with it but um I so I I got to do it full time which it's really difficult in this industry because pay stinks and there's competition and um, there's a lot of things that you have to jump over. Now, if you got, you can do it, be a harvest intern and move from somewhere and, you know, I wasn't paid the first year as I shouldn't have been. I was earning my keep in sense and, and learning and absorbing, but I also didn't know how I would make that work because I, I did it wrong. I caught the bug and I was in love, but I had no structure for how to sustain this. Like this was gonna be a great, just like France, it's gonna be another little great break and then I'm gonna have an emotional crisis and want to do something, have to do something else, you know, out of necessity of health insurance or whatever else. And um, I don't know, so basically I talked to Andy over the spring and, and summer before the harvest and said, I wanna make a little wine. Um, doesn't have to be a label, doesn't have to be put out there, but I, you know, I. I see the decisions you're doing. I kind of want to like, ideally in a different world, if I started when I was 20, let me do this for 10 years, but like I have bills to pay, I have things. And so I wanted to test it further and make those decisions and be even more accountable. Um, and he let me and um, I worked off a bit of, of Pinot from him and then found a vineyard um, through, through Herb Quaddy, a great farmer down in Southern Oregon. Kind of out of luck, I gave him some specs of what I was hoping for. Beggars can't be choosers, and when you're asking for 1,800 pounds of fruit, you kind of you, you you go with it to a degree. But you know, a family vineyard that you know has sustainability in mind and is moving more and more towards that. So I got hooked up with Lane Vineyard and drove down there a bunch of times. Hauled up the you know like slept in the back of the truck. Again, I, I like sleeping in weird places. If I could summarize for the the you know the, the, the shorter version of this, it's just I, I sleep in weird places and have weird hours of sleep. <laughs> but um you know made those wines alongside him and he ski had doubled you know he doubled in seventeen and doubled in eighteen basically and and it was just it was a a great match and, and lesson for both of us in a way. Mm -hmm. Made those wines, harvest ended. Um, it was, you know, I finished basically late December. No one's hiring in late December, so I just had a next Christmas and just like thought, I'll pay rent next month somehow. <laughs> um, I found a great fit and um, selling wine, just managing a, you know, a smaller European market, grocery store kind of thing. One man, little department and it fit. And then I think kind of realizing like, well, now you have wine in bottle. You've, you've done all the things licensing wise and labeling and all of that stuff. You, just, you have to keep going in a sense. Mm -hmm. just, so I have a nice little kind of combination there, but all of this now looking back at those little steps has just been like continuing to try to test myself. Mm -hmm. Not just because everything was difficult, but like everything about winemaking or having a little label is things I'm really bad at. I can't manage money. I don't commit to decisions. I doubt myself. I, have, I'm, I talk a lot, but I'm, I have really low self-confidence in, in those realms. Mm -hmm. But I've tinkered forever and wanted to have something so no disrespect to wine, but it, this very much could have been anything else. 
I wanted to be Michel Gondry when I was in high school, just make music videos, you know. And then I wrote, took pictures and wrote poems. I wanted to, you know, I could, I could easily just have done that. But um, I've just, I, I've loved this process, and I'm just getting better at being me through this process, mm -hmm. just catching up a little, if you will, like millennial, whatever. Just, I'm sending a check to the, some simple little things, like sending a check to the grower on time, or showing up, or just like when it sucks extra a lot, just still doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm learning a lot from this process, so every time I get a little bit like, I have a lot of friends who, who, are, who should be in this seat and who have done a lot and, and know more and have more experience, but what keeps me in it, um, I think, is realizing that I'm improving myself um, and, and testing, <laughs> testing what I want to do and how, how, how well I can do it, mm -hmm. and that will reflect on the wines. They're, they're, they're good now. Then, they'll get better because I'll just know how to do it probably better but I think the product really selfishly in five and ten years will be I think someone who's more comfortable with themselves and someone who's better at doing those things because I, I don't um, I don't I, I think the, the I think it's the method of going to school for it and then learn, working for twelve dollars an hour for how many years in the kind of classic mm -hmm. valley model is, is great but there's these other voices you know the only I didn't want to, to sit and talk with you because I, I felt undeserving of the, that space. But I think making room for different stories and different people who have different methods, like, um, I'm not far along enough to, to give advice to anyone, but there's, there's like a Tyler right now on his bike biking to a cellar because he loves it. And like, mm -hmm. do it, you know, like, it helped, it, it saved me. It, it, it saved me in a lot of ways. And uh, it's really cool to sit here not thinking I would. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's the answer to why wine do I guess. Good answer. That's a good answer. So I'm I'm curious. You mentioned your kind of the your your difficulty the, the committing, difficulty committing, and mm -hmm. difficulty like feeling like you have to change. You have you have to change it. So what is it about the sucky part of wine that keeps you <coughs> makes you happy? Like why does it want you to make you want to come back? Part of it's directly related to wine and part of it I think is just process based. The process based part is like watching my dad at one point, he's like, you know, staying up, sleeping. We lived a mile from his town, but he'd sleep there. And we th I thought that was silly when I was a kid, but I get it now. Sleeping in uncomfortable places. Mm -hmm. It's a generational thing. And he's just, the more chocolate I make, the more chocolate I have to sell. Um, so just testing myself where I could be comfortable. You know, like, I was in a rough place for a while, just feeling really down on myself. Not special, you know, but, but feeling really crappy. And, you know, my Sunday, Monday's off, I would always, like, take care of the house on Sundays and on Monday I have an existential crisis and just can't wait to get to work so I can be distracted from myself and distracted from the fact that I don't like what I'm doing sufficiently. I don't feel like I'm building something from that. So like there was a tank in California, that one right there, um, that a retiring winemaker was selling like for cheap. And I didn't see where it was in California. This is a couple weeks, two weeks ago maybe. And um, she was, you know, it would allow me to basically double production from last year. All of Last Vintage can fit in that. You know, and um, the test of self, the com confrontation of self, in a sense. Um, sure, it would cost money, but it would be less than buying. I knew I had to buy something this year. Mm -hmm. So in, in two and a half days, I drove to Santa Maria, California. It's like 80 miles north of LA <laughs> on my own and just like slept in the worst hotel of my life. Mm -hmm. But every single time, it's that story in the narrative and it's not, it's not fake and it's not disingenuous because like there's plenty of, that's, that's the story I'll tell when I'm pouring it for you because, you know, there's people who have better vines than me and more experience. And my terroir, I think, is that confrontation of self. My, for right now especially, is, is that story of me just standing in front of you with something that means the world to me and hoping that a little bit of that resonates mm -hmm. in a sense. So, like, the non-wine related version of, of, of what you're asking is, is just, like, seeing how far I'll go and learning that discipline. Um, in terms of owning a business, in terms of representing myself, in terms of trusting my instincts and also learning when I'm wrong and all these things that I probably could have and should have learned but instead I was like writing poems and riding my bike in Paris. <laughs> but then with wine I think it's just, it's a fact, you know, I, I call the winery monument. Um, not in this grandiose sort of way and I, I, I guess there's a guy, Sebastian, who, who um, works with Marcus Goodfellow, sell the wines. And he's like, what are you going to call it? Um, 
And I was like, permanent peace. At first it was permanent peace, because it was a lyric from the National. And I love that idea. I've always struggled with permanence, and I'm very sentimental in so many ways. Everything is drawn out with me. <laughs> and, um, and it just didn't sound like a winery. So that was the name of the wine. And then I thought, monument. Every time I made something that I love, I did a little collection of poetry. Um, and, and I had a, like a photo blog that I maintained for like eight or so years. And when I took a picture I really liked, I called it monument. The idea being it's, to me, something small that stands for something larger. It could be, you know, I have this rock that I've owned forever, and it's probably my favorite possession. My favorite possession, because I moved around a lot as I was a kid, and I always fear losing things or, or not having it anymore, whether it's waterlogged in a basement, that happened, um, or just being lost or thrown away or, you know, negotiated in a, in a divorce or something like that. That happened, not personally. Um, and the wines are that. It's funny because it's ephemeral and it's fleeting, and once you drink it, it's gone in a sense, but. Um, <clears throat> the, event, the ambition of this project very much, I think, is captured in that word. And I think also, in a sense, when people hear oh, monument, every time I say it, the shoulders go up, and I'm just like, no, it's, it's, it's modesty. And I'm trying to kind of disprove this idea that like a monument's not a guy's face carved in a, in a mountain. It's just a thing that like, I don't have to tell my whole life, this is nice, but the bottle of wine kind of accomplishes enough of this for me. Um, I did it in a lot of senses so I could like, I, I made, you know, the first vintage, 1,300 bottles, just so I could have six of them. Two to keep, one to drink, one for my mom, one for my dad. In a lot of ways. And my dad had a, an anniversary for their 30th year for his store, and I, I walk up and surprise him. He cried, I'm going to cry. Um, and I hand him the, the bottle, and I said, year one for year 30. Um, that's, that's the money. That's, that's my heirloom, whether I have kids, whether I have a store, whether I have a brick and mortar, whatever. Um, I want to be able to leave the room. I'm talkative and I enjoy this, mm -hmm. but I want to have something that stands for me and for the people who led me here to whatever this here is. Mm -hmm. um, and I want it to say a little bit of something. I don't want it to dominate the conversation. I want you to enjoy it. I mean, do the math. 1,300 bottles, someone is going to get engaged, pregnant, break up, and then and, and, just drunk, and the rest are just drunk. <laughs> but like, it, it's, it's, it's making something, whether it's furniture or or taking a photograph or a book is allowing yourself to step behind a camera and watch life happen, mm -hmm. in a sense. And that's been the privilege. Outside of like improving myself, the privilege of that, I think, is like sneaking into people's lives in ways that they're not expecting. Because plopping a book on your table on, you know, and saying, this is great, it's my life story, is wonderful. But I want to find a sneakier way to meander into your life mm -hmm. and allow you to, to, envision, to see me a little bit, mm -hmm. I guess. It's an incredibly personal way yeah. to make wine and to sell yeah. wine. So how do you handle that? That's a, that's a lot to put out there in front of people uh, on the off chance they don't, aren't going to like it. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with putting yourself out there like that to an audience that may not be so enthusiastic? I can't control your, your you know, like my job is to make wine and be better and make it pretty. And like I don't down, I really don't downplay, I love the labels like the old partner I moved here with um, is like, you realize this is an art project. You know, a friend was ever kind of talking about this. And it's really super true. Like, um, that doesn't discount, I don't mean art like collared shirt, I'm an artist. Like, Bill Hooper from, uh, from Petro, where he's like sipping a beer, sunset's going, going by, and there's a bunch of chords and, or, you know, <clears throat> lines twisted and machines going and whatever. And he's like, this is a really fucking blue collar. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Like I knew secretly, I, like I, that my dad's brown collar. Like I'm, I, I don't belong in an office, and like it's a little bit forklift and a little bit lifting, and getting dirty. Um, so I, I can't, other than having a pretty verbose back label, which I think will be a thing until <laughs> someone tells me to just write the varietal on it. The, the front picture tells a little something, um, in a, in a not artificial and not insincere or just designing marketing in a way. That's, that will always be really important to me. I did the labels this year, it was really important because I didn't want to force an artist to become a designer and tell you, this is my vision. It's, this is so personal that like, it's not that you couldn't, you're not capable of it, you could have done it, um, but it really rounds out the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I have to learn is how to include people better, accept help and accept other people. You know, like, I, I protect a little bit, too much probably, and I have to learn how to welcome my girlfriend in. I have to learn how to let my family in on the process a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, you know, when I'm selling it to you, it's like I, it's when I took over the job at, at World Foods, which has been really supportive and lovely, the first thing I really did as being in charge was rip down all the points. 
reps always go like point sell wine and I you're right they sell that wine but if you walk into the shop and you're gonna buy a wine I don't really care if it's the pointy one you know if so if it resonates and you like the label like I don't disparage that you like the label if you like the, the varietal want to stay there great so I'm never gonna convince you I could stand here and there are some customers I go like whoa you know when I went down to Lane last time to pick up the fruit I I was gonna sleep in the parking lot of Walmart because I wanted to get to, to do the pick quicker but I instead went into a hotel parking lot and slept there with my dog and the security guy heard us and uh, you know and, and that or like we couldn't get a picking crew so I picked the entire vineyard that day on my own and sprained my wrist because it took nine hours to pick a ton and a half of fruit that those are charming things and they 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 draw a line of, of seriousness maybe that sounds like okay this guy's got to get his act together <laughs> but refining it through the ridiculousness of me like I inherit that's the DNA of my dad it's just I'm here and if like I'm not gonna say if you like me, you'll like the wine, but um, what really resonated this, this year and last is someone said like, I, I see you in these wines. Mm -hmm. It could be spiritual, it could be the label, it could just be like seeing pictures of Harvest and, and seeing me, someone that they believe in or like, really enjoying myself, but I'm in these wines, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I have to distinguish it with a story and with myself because there's a lot of peop other people who, who use those vineyards great great winemakers and my wines are not better or worse it depends mm -hmm. so i this you know this wine or this this wine in the sand <laughs> is the division between me and my effort and you and if you don't you know it's okay if you don't like it or if it doesn't resonate or if it doesn't mean as much as it means to me because there's somewhere someone being interviewed about a beer that they make that i'm just sort of like it's fine but that's imp that's important like if three percent of people like are knocked out of the park and then mm -hmm. My, you know, sharing the wine with my mom, and she's like, "No, it's don't, it's wasted on me. My palate's not good." Mom, try it. Like you have, this is really important to me. You have to try this wine. Um, and she did, and she said, "I actually really like this." <laughs> you don't have to say actually. You get to say you like that, and that's great. So, well, it's, it's different, you know, than your wine friends who could tell you why you like it. Like, no, you liked it. <laughs> so that brings you back to the record store. You don't have to have a pin in your in your lapel or a, you know, a, an earring. I sound like a boomer right now. You don't have to have a safety pin in your ear to love punk rock, and you don't have to have a film degree to have a film resonate. You know, this, is, this for now is my medium. And when I put a cork in it, When I, when I finished that... a lot that, of lead up for one really bad yeah, pun. It's, this whole winery. <laughs> how many tens of thousands of dollars, you know, just to make that joke. But truly, when, when that wine gets a cork placed into it, <laughs> and it sits on a shelf anonymously where I don't matter, in a good way, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm divorced from the process. Whether it's my dad proudly showing this wine to his friend, which is a wonderful part of this process, or you just really like the way it tastes, or, or maybe just seeing the label and being like, why is that called daughter? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a story. Mm -hmm. um, that's where it ends, and, and, it, and it's yours. And as someone obsessed with permanence, it's sort of funny and, and tragic, but lovely that I made something that's incredibly fleeting. Mm -hmm. like, done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that, that's the medium, and that's, this is where I ended up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about the rest of the, you mentioned this art project, you know, the wine in the bottle, but also what's on the outside of the bottle, mm -hmm. and, and the, so tell me a little bit about the process of choosing what varietal you wanted to make uh, and then what you were going to name it and the story that was going to go behind the labels. Tell me about kind of that pairing of wine to story to, to name as you've started your, your label here. Um, I mean, part of it, I guess, is I love Syrah and I knew I wanted to work with Syrah, so that, that got me to the lanes. Um, wonderful people, with the, they, live, you know, they lived on the vineyard since, since 1978 or so planted it themselves. Um, and I like that because I love the underdog. Um, Andy, when, when I was saying I really want to make Syrah, he said, wonderful, great. Um, what, what, he had some great quote about how hard it is to sell Oregon Syrah. And I will say, like, there's been some lovely Oregon Syrah I had, and there's some I haven't liked at all. And there's some that are just kind of lackluster and fine. And I'm happy to be placed by anyone in any of those categories because I think there are people who, who rightfully believe that taste is super subjective. Um, but I like the challenge. I, I, there's enough voices with Pinot Noir. Um, I, maybe I'll make a Pinot. I have Pinot in some of the wines. Great. Um, no disrespect. Um, 
but I want to do something a little different. I like, you know, coming from retail where you taste a lot of wines, um, I think blending is a really strong thing that I can offer because I've not more than anyone. I, I didn't realize that everyone who did my job didn't taste as much wines as I, I do. There's a, there's a bunch of us. It's not just me, but that, that is, Andy had kind of said, like, that's a strong asset that you don't realize. Mm -hmm. um, working at Vinopolis, a lot of winemakers would come in and like buy Burgundy or other, but like in a nice way, and I'm not, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn and saying they're very unaware of a lot of other things that are happening. We're looking at Burgundy saying, oh, I had a great, you know, Corton that was changed my life. But retail's interesting because I really am an inter intermediary between different populations who know and care about very different things. Mm -hmm. Obsessive uh, importers who, whose task at life is to find wonderful wines, curious people who just want to learn about the world by getting a buzz, mm -hmm. and winemakers who just have their blue collar job to do. And um, I've, I've really enjoyed having my foot in different areas. Mm -hmm. So that's very much guided, like the idea of Syrah. Um, working in retail and making wine is cheating, not because you can sell your own wine better, because I'm the worst salesperson of my own wine in my own store. My boss forced me to carry it. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, but it's cheating because I get to kind of see everything that's out there and it's market research to just understand, you know, what people, what resonates with people. I always make wines that I want to drink that I believe in and I'm not saying that I'm doing, taking notes saying, oh, make 10 more gallons of this because you'll sell so much more. But I get to peer into a whole world and I get to see and take the temperature of an entire customer base, which has been really fun. So that's another reason why labels have been so important to me. And, and maybe it's just another way in to just have a cute looking but but it's just it's it's just that finishing touch that you can you work that hard and you spend that much time. I keep looking at the wines, the babies. <laughs> Why not make it personal and beautiful? I have nothing to hide. There's nothing. I'll 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 break down and get sensitive and and. But there's nothing you could ask me right now that I I don't feel it, you're entitled to know mm -hmm. if you ask it with the right motivations or intentions. And the same thing. I'll put anything on that within whatever the LCC, LCC lets me. Um, this has been a way to bear my heart. And so like, you know, daughter is the label is um, a finger painting that my niece did um, outside of the wine, her being born just like, she's not even my daughter, but like rebirth for me, it was amazing. My baby sister has a baby and it's incredible. So I stole one of her finger paintings and made it black and white. Um, and then I wrote daughter over top just basically as, a, as an homage to a lineage between my grandmother who had passed just before my sister had a kid. And that would have been so nice to kind of connect that to my mother, who was super instrumental in everything I do, to my sister, um, who's like a, a best friend peer in a lot of ways. Um, she's five years younger than me in age, but has two kids now. So she's like 50 now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't edit that. Whatever I email you with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, she's, but her experience is so different and her maturing and watching her kids. Um, she understands why I would say that in a lot of ways. <clears throat> and then Permanent Peace, you know, was the wine I really set out to make in a lot of ways. And the, the most of me kind of went into that. Um, the label's a, a very good friend from, from New York who had it modeled for pictures. Um, she's, it's a photo of her bust or sort of like up here to her neck. And I, I cropped it in such a way that made it somewhat anonymous. And I wanted to have um, nakedness without nudity, in a sense, because working in, in wine, there's a lot of like female bodies that pseudo consensually are used to sell a thing in an, in, in an industry that's rife, you know, with, with sexual assault and sexual harassment and whatnot. So it was a careful thing. And I don't want to say it was tongue in cheek because I, I take it really seriously, but it was me testing the limits um, in a lot of ways. So I, I added that picture and made it a, a half tone, like a newspaper, sort of dot, 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 dot. Um, we pasted it onto two four by eight pieces of wood and left it out underneath um, the highway over here, went back to it every day for, for seven days and photographed it, watching the kind of decay. Because I love that idea that a piece, it's not just, a, there's nothing, I should use someone else's painting. <laughs> but it's not about just like, this is one moment in time. It's sort of like, I love the variables. I love, you know, I studied a lot of like John Cage as a, as, as a college student, as a smarmy, artsy idiot, you know? There's a guy at the Clarine Farm who makes one of his blends because he rolls dice and then he decides 50 Marsan. <laughs> Different, you know, and, but it always comes out okay because he knows his, 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 you know, the composite pieces. And so, you know, the labels, I always want to be, have action. Where again, to you, it's just like, I don't get it. There's no name of the varietal on the, on the bottle or like, why is there a kind of naked person, whatever. It's super meaningful for to me and then that will always be the execution of that wine, you know, like the, the smithereens, the, the, the kind of like practice wine I did, 
It's just like a picture, a crappy picture I took on one of the first days I lived in France. And I wanted to like mo monumentalize or, or remember that moment. I didn't know it would later be a thing that I put out into the world, but it's, it's super apropos and it's, it's wonderful. And like, it's very much part of my process unapologetically. Um, maybe it's just something for me to do while I learn, how, learn more about how to make wine, but you know, I'm, to I'm totally okay with it. <laughs> I think that kind of answered your question. Absolutely answered my question. Yeah. Um, tell me about the on the winemaking side of things. Uh, you have this. You have a background in wine shops. You had you had a palate. You had a knowledge of, of wines of the world. Tell me about what what you had to learn to actually make wine. Was it, were, were there big steps? Were there big uh, missing pieces of information? Were there big surprises as you got yeah. into the actual production side? It's everything's like way harder and way easier than you'd think in a lot of ways. Um, and part of it, like you can't divorce the person from it because it's a lot of it's just trusting your instincts and then committing and being thorough. And like, you know, there are times that I drove once I moved back into Portland that I drove an hour to Methvin because I thought I left a gauge wrong and I was going to lose the vintage. You know, there was a time when <clears throat> bottling permanent piece. Um, I saw a little leak and I was like, great, the track lever's not on right. It's about to burst, I'll lose the entire thing. And I just like ran around, grabbed someone's dirty tank, cleaned it out fast and this and that. Turned out to be a tiny, tiny hairpin hole in my actual tank, which would have been totally fine. But committing to what you're doing and trusting it and doing it, yeah. someone's gonna censor and totally, or, or totally contradict me and they're right to, because like understanding bacteria strains and looking at healthy, you know, native yeast form, you know, um, colonies, or cultivating yeast or whatever you do in winemaking is really, really important. Um, but it was like kind of addressing that like oxygen is a big issue, but in certain ways there's times where oxygen is okay. The first time we were ever bottling and we took over a lid, I was like, what are you doing? And it's like, it's a, it's, we do that, you know, like that's, that's part of it. It's not good, we shouldn't do it too much. Mm -hmm. um, I've really enjoyed like, I've really enjoyed um, like taking labs and learning more about the biology and the other things behind it. Um, I'm a very hands-on person though, so like when I do something, I kind of have to learn and know why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. So nothing against classroom winemaking, but I can already answer that question that I'd have of myself. I'd like to go to school, to be honest. I'd like to take formal classes in a really unnatural setting. I mean, in terms of not in a cellar, but also recipe-based conventional winemaking. Um, if I'm rebelling against something, I really want to understand what and why I'm rebelling or why I'm choosing to do something I'm doing. So when I'm learning how to take labs and, and understanding, you know, the last step, I think a lot of my peers want to rush to owning a vineyard or to farming. I have people who have lived on the vineyard or, or lived in the proximity of that vineyard for decades who've, who know those vines. I want to earn the space where I can stand there and, and you know, say, this is my pick date. This is how I'd like you to crop. Um, you know, Scott had mentioned, he's like, that you have a great position that like, and I think this is very true, when you own a business and you're giving someone money and you're doing something, you, you're you buying a little time. Mm -hmm. So if I want the vineyard to be organic, I'm not gonna knock, you know, knock on the door and just, and yell at you because you're doing it wrong. Um, it's definitely, it, all these things are doable, not irrigating, organics, different kinds of, you know, winemaking products. But I wanna work hand in hand and say, hey, I'm willing to pay more for it. I'm willing to spend the time. I'm willing to be here for it. And, and that will be part of the education. Mm -hmm. um, because we leave out farming big time in natural wine and wine in general, but I don't own land and, and I don't plan to anytime soon because I have so much to learn on this front. I have a lot of really trustworthy good people that I'm going to work in conjunction with and learn from them and offer what I need to be a good client and to be a long lasting client because they, they want me to succeed. You know, they want me to sell more wine and buy more grapes. That's the economics are really nice. <laughs> so it would benefit them to, to, listen to how people want to make wine, but I think that we always look at that as a one-sided conversation. I think there's a lot of, of, of wisdom in people who have farmed it differently than I would have liked for a while, or who have done things that I didn't know about or didn't expect. Mm -hmm. But yeah. You mentioned being drawn to natural wine early on before, before it was really necessarily known as natural wine, before mm -hmm. it was kind of the movement it is at the moment. What about it? What, why, <coughs> what, 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 what intrigued you about it? What excited you about it? I really don't like the idea of natural wine being something about like tying a hand or two behind your back and saying, look how much I did with how little. It was a feat, you know? Um, it, I mentioned rebellious before. It is kind of rebellious, but we also made natural wine before we made conventional wine. I mean, like medicine is good. I, there's no reason to say anything after 1950 is bad. I think we should listen to what's happening and how people are making wines. Um, I guess I'll get a little woo-woo and be like, you know what, the hangover's not so bad. <laughs> not as bad. <laughs> And I, and I do mean that. It's 
but it's also like you know there's natural wine fairs and places where like people are out like doing lines of coke or smoking cigarettes while they're talking about how sulfur is the worst thing in the world um, I probably was a little more dogmatic about sulfur until I had a lot of money and time in one little tank and it was like out of touch max out at like 30 parts per million it's like five percent of what's in dried meat or, or, or fruit I'm fine with it you know and I'll, I will it's a flexible thing, um, but it's just the way that wine was that, that you know I sold in New York and drank and enjoyed. So it came, enjoying the product came first. Mm -hmm. I mean, in another galaxy, classic rock is punk, mm -hmm. and then there's people who just liked it and then found out it was rebellious. You know what I mean? But like the metal and punk are great because it's about pushing boundaries and seeing how loud or how this or how whatever you can get. Um, it just it naturally was what I liked. So. I, I could have grown up in California and just, you know, only drank trophy wines and that would have been, I would hope that knowing the person I am, I don't think I would have grown up to do that, but I can't, you know, I don't blame anyone who kind of grew up in that environment. So I want to be as inclusive as possible in letting people know that there's like a seat at the table to drink and make and talk about these wines to understand how elastic food is, how elastic and important politics are. Um, and I don't want to isolate anyone. I'm going to take risks and I'll say things. I'll, you know, just like a lot of my peers, I want to take, you know, have opinions, but someone else who works in the cellar was like, I don't know if I'd want to do this interview because like a couple years ago, I, I had different motivations or different ideas about things. Totally valid, but like, I hope, I, I want to watch this in five years and be like, nope, you don't do that anymore, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm Hungarian, like I need to prove myself wrong. That's part, I'm growing and I'm learning and if in five years I'm, I'm doing exactly the same thing in the same way and I haven't been heartbroken in some way, um, I hope, you know, things go well. I hope wines taste good, but my long-term goal is to really learn from it and, and, and confront myself. And the space that I occupy with that of minimal intervention or whatever you want to call it, um, I, it might be wimping out there, it might be me, me branding it. I call what I do like I, sincere Oregon wines because it's, it's just like natural wine is not just a cellar, it's a, it's a farm. I said before, like terroir, I am part of terroir, not in some way, but like I'm part of that product. And if we want to make natural, good, or honest wines, we have to look at the people who sell them and how they sell them and, and things that are kind of boring but really necessary. Like how we, you know, Assemblage is a great organization in the Valley now um, that talks about inclusion of, of female voices in, in wine. Um, and there's so many other things in terms of including other people because that's a lot of, I think that's what will keep people engaged and I think that keeps on growing, but like more seats at the table are a good thing. Mm -hmm. Not just because there are more, more, more wallets and pockets and empty glasses, but um, natural wine has done a really good job of that in a lot of ways, of letting people who have a different vocabulary or a limited vocabulary talk about wine production and the wines that they like. Um, but I think we have to be careful because I don't want it to be a popularity contest or, or a contest at all. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll see in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the Oregon wine industry that you came into. What, was, what were your first impressions of the industry at large? And, and perhaps how has that changed? What does it look like now versus what it looked like when you got into it? I'm glad when I was like upset about how poor of a, of a wine rep I was that I didn't let like my New York kind of gruff or rushed personality get involved because it's such an inter interconnected place. And by and large, from what I've seen and been a part of, I guess, really inclusive in that way. Um, if, I was, if I needed something or had a question and was proud, you know, wasn't too proud to ask about it, I could put out a message and, and get any sort of help, mm -hmm. material, knowledge, time, from so many different people who are, are wonderfully good at this. And, and um, I've really, really, it's working in retail, like selling different wines and then standing in front of people who didn't know about a certain like Loire region that I thought was really obvious and talking to them like, you make the XYZ wines? Oh my God, you know? Um, I love going to like, to Terry's, the supply store and seeing a bunch of winemakers whose wines I love just rush in and out and have other lives and do other things, you know? Like we're lacking a little bit of a, of a sense of celebrity by and large, and that in terms of attitude of winemaker, but also how we present the wines and sell them. And there's certain things that we could probably doll up and dress up better. Because um, people, you know, working retail, people ask where I should go, where they should, you know, 
to tour wine country and it's like it's a little disparate you know like definitely go to McMinnville and walk down a little block there it's super cute and depending on you and your party you can go here or here I think logistic on a logistical level like um, there's a good tourism board and McMinnville has done really, really great work getting the wines out to New York but we're really disparate in a good way because the the story has yet to fully be told and there's a lot of voices and I believe and trust the people who are like we need to keep keep our identity rooted in Pinot Noir um, because it's wonderful I go to New Jersey <clears throat> my sister and her husband are super happy I'm making these wines because they love Oregon wine and I go and wander on a shelf there and I see a bunch of wineries I've never heard of which is weird and it's maybe like phantom kind of ghost custom crush wineries which make me feel kind of icky um, and then just giant there's things I haven't heard this world is so much bigger than I r realize or understand being in Minneapolis or New Orleans or New York or New Jersey um, or even like Washington or California understanding the world that we have here and then kind of cutting away from it so on a, like, literally, really boringly, on a logistics level, like there was supposed to be a train that was going to go down through the valley from Portland that mm -hmm. probably, you know, money-interested people didn't want to happen, or the car industry, which is the worst. I'm going to go on the record saying that. <laughs> um, but like logistics would help mm -hmm. in terms of like getting, letting people have a different experience other than just the people who pop up on Google. I really love the urban winery climate here. Because um, there's a lot more voices. There's classic Pinot Noir producers, but there's also, you know, weirdos like me doing things. And I don't want weirdos like me to dominate the conversation because I respect a lot of the, where I come from and, and whose people are doing things. But then there's tinkerers that are really great that are a foil. And I think we're really mutually beneficial. Chad Stock talking about the you know, diversity and getting away from Pinot is totally valid. And it doesn't invalidate also someone who's like, this is Pinot country long, latitudinally. But mm -hmm. we've got, you know, climate. To, to worry about and we have a growing market and a lot of different palettes and people so there's room I think it's like economics will determine that too go plant Zweigel and see if it works and put enough muscle behind it and we're gonna grow we're gonna have just too much Pinot at some point <laughs> and, and I just I don't want prices to go up like California I don't want white columns to go up like in California um, but outside of land and people kind of going back to what I was talking about before a little bit um, including other voices and other people. Um, I know what it's like to be a young man selling wines at a pretty young age, not only underage, but through my 20s and even now as, as a 33 year old. Um, so, you know, people of color, women, anyone who's in a larger society been kind of pushed aside or, or, or second guessed. Um, I can only imagine how hard it is in certain areas of this, especially this kind of class-based, consumable, not necessary, whatever you want to call it. Um, industry and you know you can I'm a white guy talking about it but we need white guys talking about it and we need um, to make sure on our shelves and in our discussions we're talking about other people and ways walks of life and I'm not just saying what you look like that's a big one it's a really really big one um, but I needed a little boost up to do what I'm doing and, and there was a lot of, in another world I couldn't have done or been able to do what I'm doing right now I, I relied on, a, on some good people who kind of helped someone who doesn't own land, like, a, like most of us, make something great. Someone who didn't know how to do everything and, and, and I got their kind of trust. So if we have something to offer as like a little liberal bastion um, that's a little more open-minded and a little more patient, it's making sure we're continuing to have more people at the table in, ev in every sense of that word. Um, and I think that will continue to differentiate us. And I hope it's contagious in ways that also, you know, we shouldn't have a monopoly on, on a healthy uh, industry. Um, yeah, I'm worried about foreign money. I'm worried about Californians just buying up lots and pots of land. But like passionate, hungry people who do different things, maybe even that they, that they had hoped to do, you know, um, or plan to do, working within constraints and, and finding a way. Um, I'm a really strong believer and defender of, of that, of just like follow your gut, ask for other people's help, um, and, and make sure that as you establish your seat at the table, you're, you're making room in some way, mm -hmm. however that can be. So what do you see as you look ahead for the Oregon industry? What is it going to look like <clears throat> in, in 2030, for example? Mm. I'm probably the worst person to ask because I'm just like, I'm so in right now of just like, I like what I'm doing. I think I have more prescriptions or, or like, or hopes for what's gonna happen because, I mean, look at, look at other economies. It's just like people with more means and more money and more influence move ahead further. So like, we're gonna have that. 
we're gonna have bigger tasting rooms with larger made wines that have less character and um, I'm a little bit okay with that sometimes because what allows me to have flexible turns paying for fruit is larger wineries paying for more fruit on time. So like the taxonomy of, of that is okay, but keeping it in check. And um, I don't know, maybe in 2030 I'll hire someone. So again, I hope I prove myself right. <laughs> but, but making sure that people can, can, can survive in this industry in different ways. Mm -hmm. And that goes from like restaurant tipping and, and, and like, taking sexual harassment in restaurants seriously and it goes to making sure that we're shopping at world foods instead of whole foods <laughs> support supporting you know small retailers it makes sure you know like that distributors are treating their employees well and that suppliers are paying winemakers on time and and i'm not giving you a lot of what i think it'll look like this, but this is fine if we let economics the way in every other industry go the way it's, it's going to disclude and, and hurt a lot of people mm -hmm. and that's not really the fault of wine that's just capitalism and time and people um but the the the, the sense of of um fraternity here i guess and uh the fact that everyone worked for everyone you know there's enough like gatekeepers here who knew what it's like to you know not have an industry at all mm -hmm. um our story is really young and i think that's good marketing, but at the same time, it's nice because we remember, I'm not even gonna include myself in this, but there's people in Oregon who really remember what it was like before, and it's so much easier to shape the future if you understand history. Um, we don't have to stick rigidly to it. Let's plant a bunch of Blaufrankisch and, and make different weird things and make wine in little warehouses and not have tasting rooms and do and challenge norms. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of hope for, for Oregon wine. Um, and I hate to like be less romantic, but like a lot of our survivability has to do with like big government -y stuff, like making sure people can live <laughs> and get health insurance and understanding our climate. Um, there's a lot of really knowledgeable, passionate people out there and they'll make this work. Um, I plan and hope to be among them, learning from them and eventually teaching someone else too. Um, I think my hope is just that we have a big table full of people who are willing to help each other. <laughs> rah, rah, rah. <laughs> it's a very nice vision, though. It's, it's better yeah. than some we've heard, so I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> are people more negative or positive about that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Maybe we can maybe we'll do that after yeah. the interview. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what about as you look ahead for yourself? And what do you, where do you see yourself and, and, and Monument, perhaps, as you look ahead five, ten years in the future? Besides hiring a person, of course. No, I don't want to. I don't think I'd be good. I'm too controlling. <laughs> it's staying to where I can just still stay alive and not, not, I don't know. That's where I think it really is too early to tell. Not because I'm not willing to commit to ink a certain vision. Um, I really, I hope that talking to Tyler five years from now or 10, um, that I still really like this. And that's, that's the non-committal answer. But like, even when I'm like worried about bills and my bills are much lower than a lot of people's <laughs> and I'm worried about the wine and whatever, like I, I march into these doors like every, basically every day, like excited and happy and proud. Um, because aside of all the, the help from other people, be it just, you know, lending me, you know, advice or whatever it is and the support, you know, whatever. Um, I am really proud of it. And I, I stray away from it sometimes because I don't want to look like a guy in a crisp white shirt who's selling the fact that I'm the only person in the world and I do the best thing and I didn't, you know, learn from anyone else. Um, but I'm enormously proud of this and I'm really so happy about it. So I know with time and stress and other things in life, you get distracted and rightfully so, because like, I don't know if I could function on this level of like, woo -hoo! but I hope that something with that remains. Um, and that like, I think I'm myself right now, really uncertain. And that's why it was okay to actually sit down with you now, instead of when, you know, whatever else happens when James Suckling and I make up and we become best friends, mm -hmm. he's the worst. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to be making wine and I and and the unnecessary unsexy side is like I want to be able to to make sure that health insurance and money and, and livability and bills are all taken care of like anyone mm -hmm. but um I want to I want to be challenged I, I 
I hope that I have a little bit of a safe place, right? Of like when I'm making a wine that I know it's going to do a certain thing, but I hope that I'm curious and I hope that I'm motivated and I hope that I'm motivated for the right reasons. Um, beyond that, like, I don't see myself leaving retail anytime soon because it's just such a nice counterpoint. It's going to become unmanageable at some point. Maybe that's, so I don't know, we'll see. I, ju I just want to be as happy about this and about myself as I am right now. Mm -hmm. And if I'm making wine in five or 10 years, that that's already your, answer your question. If I'm talking to a winemaker then, then like, cool. That's it. <laughs> that's a success. Yeah, making wine and being happy. And uh, there's privilege there. There's like all sorts of like more, you know, difficult things to, to manage and, and go up against. But yeah, being a part of something and, and believing in it. That's where I hope I am. <laughs> what about uh, as you expand, are there other things you want to work with, other varietals you're excited to try, other styles you're interested in making? Are, are you thinking ahead that far, or do you have like goals in mind when it comes to that? I mean, part of it's just scale in a sense. Like, I really want to get the wines into New York and New Jersey. Um, popular market, New York, and difficult market, New Jersey. But it's important to have it in front of friends and, and not like have to dawdle with, with shipping and, and logistics and all of that. So I know that's not a varietal, but like mm -hmm. a lot of it's just making a little bit more of, of XYZ wine where I have to trust myself more and, and, and scale up, you know, 110 cases in 18, 220 last year. So effectively double, mm -hmm. mathematically double. <laughs> this year will be more, but it's like, I'm not gonna, you know, I, I made a little bit of that orange wine in, in 18. I did another little project this year. I, I wanna always have a little like pet thing, whether it's a, a style or a grape or something. And, I don't know the proportions, but I want to always kind of have that main little meat and potatoes and then something else that I'm reaching out and being curious about. Mm -hmm. um, skin contact wines are, are, are vogue and I've always really liked them and I don't need to like, that will be a part of it. I can commit to what I'll never do. This will be fun. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to make a sparkling wine. No sparkling. Okay. It, I, don't, I don't like sparkling wine really. And I wanted to put my, I wanted to see if I was brave enough to say that. Five years it's on, now. It's on the record now. No sparkling wine. Okay. Probably not a rosé either. But um, a dream, dream varietal. Whew. Well, like last year I did a, a Sauv Blanc, Chever, uh, like Chevrolet style Sauv Blanc Chardonnay blend that was sort of motivated by other wines that I had love. Mm -hmm. So when I say I'm motivated by France or Burgundy or something, it's less like, it's, it's more like a specific wine. Like my cellar is just a bunch of things that I sentimentally are attached to that are probably overaged at this point. <laughs> but, you know, like Laurent Sayard, great, you know, someone who I got to know in New York who ran a restaurant and then um, moved to France and, and started working off of the Clos Blanche winery where I always loved. Um, I found out about his, he, was, he only made a gamay that I loved. <clears throat> and his son, who went to school in this little area of Brooklyn in front of, you know, near my, my shop, was like, hey, I'm not gonna do the accent. <laughs> Papa is going to fine. <laughs> Papa is going to do a new wine. He's doing white wine. I'm like, no way. He's like, yeah, it's a blend. Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc. And I'm like, ah, oh, I love that. Cool. And it's like, lucky you became one of my favorite wines. So like, my little tip of the hat is not, you know, mm -hmm. is to. He was a person who just like worked in restaurants and made wine. And and he and then another Eminence far, um, Eminence Road Farm Winery in upstate New York made, you know, if they were here, I would never be making wine because I would be satisfied to work for him. He makes Cap Franc and Gamay and Chard and and Gewurz and whatnot. Um, wonderful New York style wineries that he just worked in marketing in New York forever and then moved up and just wanted to like ice fish and makes wonderful wines that you should check out. They're really great. <clears throat> um, I love Muscat. I love Gewurz. I'm not afraid of floral whites. I'll put that in writing too. Um, yeah, I like underdogs. I like tricking people who think they don't like something to at least open up. And that's maybe like work for myself, but maybe then there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of producers who work with underdog varietals, Ovum, Brienne Day, um, and I tip my hat to, to Minimus. Um, Scott Frank, um, I should just keep on saying names. Mm -hmm. I tip my hat to people who, who do that because they also lead the way to me working with a more legitimate or a more fashionable, and I don't mean that in a like, mm -hmm. style, sty like sty not stash, I don't know, not stylish, but so yeah. Maybe Gewurz, maybe, maybe Muscat. Um, oh yeah, I want to tinker. Well, <laughs> we, we appreciate you going with the French accent, by the way. That really, really, <laughs> really lends a lot to the story. But, I, uh, I am actually from France. I, uh, I was born in Beaujolais. 
Ich fasse ja auch das mega Schokolatier. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I wouldn't mind kind of personally to, to kind of keep on examining the wines that I really believe in and not copying them, but um, playing uh, with them because I've really, I haven't been back to France, from France, to France since I, I left in 2012. And now that I can have wine in hand, that's really cool. And I'd love to kind of walk up to Laurent and be like, I'm not copying you and I'm not trying to see your style, but like, we did that over there, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of one varietal or region, I love Southern Oregon. It's a great place for misfits who just are either priced out of the valley or are willing to drive down more often than they should mm -hmm. to, to pick up grapes and stuff like that. Um, I hope to work there more. Um, I'm open in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to kind of just play with the things that made me a retail person and, and tinker with things that inspired me because the, you know, someone I was listening to some podcast and they were like, the, there's more, there's more nobility in the, the poem than the poet, poet almost got that right. And I can say what this is so much, but then it's up to you to kind of understand what you think of it. So if I just kind of do what I like and, and take, take notes from people who, who, did that differently or whatever, and then that's okay. I'm just gonna copy a bunch of cool wines from the Loire. That's my answer. <laughs> you could do worse. You could do worse than that. Yeah. So this uh, this, this question is from, from Keanu. This is Keanu's mm. favorite question. What is the role of wine in society? Whoa. You're doing that after I talk too much? You're gonna be like, in how many words? These are your closing thoughts. What's the role in society? Um, <clears throat> it's actually, I think that's a great, that's a really great question. and. Um, wine exists somewhere in that perfect little middle point. Um, Thomas Jefferson, wine is a necessity of life. Disagree. Um, it's a necessity of a good life. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if like the inevitabilities of like war and sickness and, and getting a job are just, are just <laughs> grim. <clears throat> it's just a perfect thing in the middle that is so politicized and tied into different things with the tariffs right now that are very, very, very real. Um, we're, we're not a necessity um, in strictly a survival sense, but because of that, there's a great opportunity to see how we use it as a, as a model and as a, as a, as a, a, a means of expression. Um, I don't want to sell stocks and bonds. like. So if it's something that after the end of a, uh, you know, a difficult day, we kind of go to to just relax, or if it's a thing to like understand a culture or a, or a cuisine better or a place, um, wonderful. But I think the fact that it's often just made out to be kind of a luxury good, um, I don't like that it's made out to be that way. Um, as someone who's like been around a lot of expensive wines and been like, I want to just have a, you know, then, simple little blend from somewhere. Um, the opportunity, because the odds are a little bit against us, it, and it's our own fault for making it a luxury good, that's what I mean by that. The odds are against us because everyone's like, it's not necessary, it's not hot water and food. Um, there's an opportunity there, I think, to, to show that something of real meaning can be made of that industry and of that product. and. In wine, there's truth, <laughs> right? Like uh, being a little tipsy and, and, and engaging with someone is not the worst thing. Um, but you know, I don't know if, if wine is any better of a medium than than art or or food itself um, or some other handmade good or, or products. It's just it's an, it's a means of interpretation, and I don't think I don't think it's any better than it. it's just the one that we're, we exist within. So we just have to do our best to make this industry a good model for other industries and other people and to make our products a good articulation of my process and of a place. Um, it's, it's just an opportunity. Um, and there's hairdressers who are trying to do the same thing, right? There's, there's business people who are trying to do the same thing. There's, there's people who design clothing. Um, so maybe seeing ourselves as not as unique and just another means, another language, um, isn't the worst thing. We're, we're, we're just like other things. We're fucking blue collar. Fucking blue collar. <laughs> Bill! That's awesome. Uh, 
So all the questions that we have for you today. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? Anything we didn't cover today that you'd like to have covered? The name of my father's chop, uh, shop is Third Avenue Chocolate Shop. We have two locations. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an email address, a website? <laughs> my a my order? sister, it's really great that like my, he was estranged from my sister for a, a little while and she had her kid, first kid and, and then second and she's coming to the fold and this is super, super new. Um, and worth saying again, because who knows where, where she's at. Um, but she's kind of assumed that role that I always, was always kind of presumed of me, being the firstborn, being the son and all that stuff and I see her doing it. So, you know, during, the, the, during harvest one, one year, I just called him and I was like, it's cool, it took, me, it took me a while, Dad, and it doesn't look the same, but I'm doing the same thing you're doing. And it's true, it's totally, it's absolutely true. You're, you become your parents and you do what they do and whatnot. I just chose a different medium. No, but if you're on the Jersey Shore, go stop by. He'll, he'll the, name, give you something. The, the name again? <laughs> <laughs> what, do they th what do your parents think about your, your choice of, of vocation? Um, surprisingly, my mom, no, I would have said this is surprisingly good. <laughs> Um, my mom's happy because she knows I'm happy. Like, happy, healthy, safe is what she's always said. And, like, she, yeah, she's so supportive and lovely. And she would, she would be okay with anything as long as I'm sleeping well and all, you know, and, and, and taking care of myself. And it's been nice for my dad because we really butt heads on so many things and don't see eye to eye necessarily. But I've noticed on the, fo you know, on the phone when I'm talking about things that's going on, maybe there's a little machismo in there, but he sees me doing what he did and there's a different level of respect and understanding in the same way when you have your kids and you talk to your dad about being a parent you're like yeah you're here now you know maybe i'm here and that's fine but he we have a different language to speak and it it has helped him speak to me with me better mm -hmm. um but also it's helped me appreciate him and what he and my mom did the sacrifices they did the the because there's you know the the joyful like you know i cry during uh acceptance speeches at the Oscars and there's not a lot of that in this but they're the little moments that are your version of album of the year or or whatever are really small and it's like saying something to your dad about it him like asking an intriguing question you know mm. um they're happy I'm happy excellent <laughs> well thank you thank so you. much for your yeah, time thank today you guys. for your stories uh for all your wonderful thoughts we'll go ahead and uh, let you off the hook